heads up, dear listener, there are some very graphic descriptions of police crime scene work included in this conversation. Just wanted you to know about that in case there were some sensitive ears around. Yeah, I've seen people laying in the street screaming and wailing. Um, I've seen people making threats and, you know, reaching into their pockets like they have a weapon and, you know, mad at everybody, mad at the whole world and threatening me and threatening the police officers and threatening the neighbors. And 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 I've seen a lot of people just in shock. That is the voice of Jared Altick, a police chaplain with the Kansas City Police Department. And he is my guest on this episode of The Nook Podcast. My name is Stephen, and I am so honored to have you listening today as we close out Pastor Appreciation Month with this interesting twist. Jared has been a pastor at Wyandotte County Christian Church for the last 25 years, and it's only been in the more recent time that he began working as a volunteer chaplain. Cops and pastors have a lot of overlap, and I realize, man, I have a lot in common with these people. And I, I seem to just in my natural disposition have an understanding of, of kind of the dynamic of what it meant to be a cop, even though I have never been a sworn officer. And so uh, about five years ago, I, I decided, you know, I need to pursue this. And so I got some specialized training and um, reached out to some other police chaplains and, and got involved. And now for the last three or four years, I've been uh, pretty heavily involved. And so police chaplaincy is the addition uh, to my ministry in recent years. Could we start with your magic pager? I, I yeah. just, I, there's, there's <laughs> such a, I love that that's your, your technology connection, but obviously that's, that means something when that pager goes off. Yeah. Yeah. As a chaplain here in KCK, we are given a car and a pager and we trade that off from one chaplain to the next. And so uh, late tonight, I'll go to another chaplain's house and pick up, pick up the car and it's a police car and uh, um, I'll get the car and I'll get the pager, which is the very cutting edge of 1990s technology. Mm -hmm. And, and so that pager, um, when that thing goes off, there is a, a real mix of emotions. There's a kind of a roller coaster of emotions there's, and I've thought a lot about it because, because it's, it's, it's difficult to put into words what I feel when I hear that thing go off. Cause, cause I have a little bit of pager PTSD, you know, mm-hmm. I, I hear, a, I hear the microwave beep and I jump, I startle. And, and when it first goes off, there is, there's fear, uh, because, because it means somebody died and, and I, now seen quite a few dead bodies and every kind of homicide and suicide and bodies that weren't discovered for a week and are mm-hmm. in different stages of decomposition, um, different kinds of accidents and mutilations of the body and, and uh, lots of different uh, living conditions that people lived in squalor before they mm-hmm. died. Uh, a lot of drug overdoses. There's you know just a lot of, of smells and sights and things that are very traumatizing. And, and so there's a little bit of fear. Um, there's, there's a lot of, of, uh, disappointment sometimes in the pager goes off because you, you had plans. You already knew how your next hour was going to go. You thought you were going to watch mm. TV with the kids or you were working on, you know, I, I, maybe I was working on my sermon or, or something. And, and now suddenly that's interrupted and this urgent thing has jumped in the way. And so there might be disappointment that I have to get up and leave the dinner table or something. But, but there's also a feeling of purposefulness and, and that's a good feeling. It's not, I don't feel good that somebody has died and that somebody needs the chaplain or, or that the chaplain should be present for the sake of the police officers or whatever. But, but because that work is so fulfilling and because I feel God's pleasure when I do it, I, I don't know if you can remember the movie chariots of fire where um, the main character is an Olympic runner, but he's also going to be a missionary. And there's some deliberation, not only mm-hmm. if he should yes. run on Sunday, but whether but whether he should be running at all. Maybe he should just go to China and be a missionary. 
And he tells yeah. another character in the, in the book and in the, in the movie, I think maybe his sister or somebody, but he tells somebody else, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. And, mm. and that strikes a chord with me because when I go and I'm sometimes not actively really doing anything, I'm just there. I'm just, I just have what chaplains call a ministry of presence. There's purposefulness in that. And, and officers thank me for being there and, 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 and citizens thank me for reaching out to them, showing compassion and, and helping them through those first few hours after a loved one's been murdered. And, and the work that I do is so satisfying that, that it definitely provides a counterweight to the stress and the fear and the anxiety and the other things mm. that also happen when that pager goes off. Well, that's, I love that terminology because what I had just written down here was that your, your presence itself must be comforting, especially for officers who do know you and that it, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and guess that it doesn't matter how many of those scenes you walk up on. It's never old hat. Uh, they're all a little bit different. Whether it's, yeah. whether it's you or the officers that are already on scene, that brutality is still something that has to be dealt with all by itself. It, it's not unusual for me to, to go to a scene and there's usually, if it's an outdoor scene, there's perimeter, there's yellow tape and they they station, uh, officers all the way around. So at every street, there's an officer guarding that yellow tape so that people don't cross the police line. Mm. And so one of the things I'll do while I'm there, sometimes I'm there for an hour, sometimes I'm there for five or six hours. But what I'll do is, is I'll walk around to the perimeter to each patrol car and check in with the officers and I'll ask them how they're doing. And a common response from those officers is, well, it's not my first dead body. Which is to say, I don't want to admit that I'm vulnerable. <laughs> yeah. And so, so move along, chaplain, check on the next guy. And, and my answer to that, if I chose to answer, which I usually just smile and move along, but, but my answer to that is it's not the first dead body that's going to upset you. It's going to be the 10th or the 50th or the 100th because it reminds you of a loved one. Um, mm -hmm. you're no longer a young 25 year old officer. You're a 35 or 40 year old officer and you have kids. And now this young adolescent that's dead in the street looks like your child that's yeah. at home uh, playing Xbox. And, and that's the one that, it, and it's not your first dead body. It's, it's that dead body. That's going to really, really cause a moral injury and, and, and bother a person. And so, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's nothing routine about police work and the work that they do. And, and there's nothing routine about what us chaplains experience when we're with the police. Um, do you feel like you're, you're in a sense, walking two roles in those times in that, I, I mean, I realize your presence is what it is, but there is, there's the officer side and then there's the, the victim family side or that next of kin. I mean, it's, it's essentially a two edged sword that, you know, you're probably going to have to deal with in each of those scenarios. Yeah. I, I'm absolutely doing two different jobs at once. Uh, the, the responsibility to the citizens of, of Wyandotte County, um, those, those citizens that's short-term care, I'm like the paramedic. A paramedic doesn't provide mm -hmm. you long-term care. He just gets you to the doctor. He stabilizes you, takes you to the hospital. A chaplain does the same thing. I'm providing short-term pastoral care. So I will pray with you. I will stand with you. I will help explain things. A lot of times my job is doing interpretation when the when the fire battalion chief or the police officer is saying something in their jargon, I'll translate that to regular mm. human and, and, and help explain what's going to happen. I, I especially help with like how the body is going to be removed from the scene, whether it's mm. going to go to the coroner or whether to go straight to a funeral home. And there's different situations that dictate that. And uh, the circumstances will, will determine where that body will go and when the family will have access to the body. And, and explaining some of those things and the misconceptions, that, that is all short-term care. The long-term care is with the officers. And, and our chaplain association also takes care of the police or the, the police department, the fire department, and the sheriff's office. But I focus primarily on patrol in the police department. So my long-term responsibilities with those patrol officers, a lot of young men, 
uh, but men and women and some older, but, but my average officer is, you know, 26, 27 years old and male. Mm. And, and that, that's my average officer. And so I am, am trying to, to build long-term relationship to get behind the badge because it can take a year or two it, you, you, to, to get there. You can't just walk in and say, Hey, I am the chaplain. Tell me all your secrets. Yeah. A cop is so suspicious. They'll never do that. It, it's going to take a long time of you not messing up and slowly building trust before they begin to open up and you can get behind the badge. So that's a long-term thing. So you're absolutely right. There's a short-term component, a long-term component. If I'm on a scene for a couple hours, I'm often jumping back and forth between the family and the officers, back to the family, back to the officers, uh, just kind of playing it by ear, which side needs more attention in that particular moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do by chance, do, do your superiors or the folks that you answer to in those, those scenarios, is there ever any kind of a, a clamp on what you can say to a victim's family, uh, you know, yes. just, uh, knowing that you're a pastor, do you have to kind of pull back on how much you share or, you know, the comfort has to come through an eyedropper as opposed to, you know, yeah. a fire hose? Yeah. Well, you can't make promises that mm. they're going to find the perpetrator because we don't solve a hundred percent of our homicides. Yeah. And, 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 and I walk in the situation, it's common that I don't really even know what happened. Uh, the mm -hmm. investigation is just beginning. And for me to speculate uh, would be damaging. And, and even though I'm not a paid employee of the police department, I'm a volunteer, I do represent the department. And so I need to be very careful how, mm -hmm. I, how I talk about what's happening and what I might promise or or guarantee in some sense, that's just, I, I can't do that. And so, yes, I have to be very guarded about what I say. And chaplains have gotten themselves in trouble mm -hmm. promising too much or getting too fired up. And, and oh, yeah, the police, I mean, how dare they leave that body laying there for two hours? Well, mm -hmm. th the CSI may be taking, I mean, we, we have these things that they bring in their for photographic, they have lasers, they have GPS. I mean, it, they set up these tripods and they take a three dimensional scan of the inside and outside of a crime scene, you know, indoors oh, wow. and outdoors. And it's all like geo located and, and, and high quality. I mean, it's, but it takes hours to do that, uh, depending on the size of the scene. And so that means that loved one may be laying there for a long time, but mm. later the investigators and even later in court, they can, you know, basically fly through that scene and it's, it's a three dimensional model of that scene. And, and that is such a useful tool to get a conviction and to, to get the correct answers, to get to the truth. And so I can advocate for that and, and comfort the family and say, look, it, we're, we're honoring your loved one by taking our time. And, and I can help explain that. And a lot of times I'm wearing civilian clothes. I, I do have some chaplain shirts and jackets, but a lot of times I'm wearing normal street clothes and I can explain that I'm a chaplain and, and this is why they're taking so long. And, and that kind of, um, that kind, that kind of helps. Right. Okay. That's, that's amazing. I mean, I, I had no idea that there was so much going on in, and I mean, I think we're also tainted by what we see on TV. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that it's hard to really get a perspective on what you walk up on and what's probably already been happening before you get there, and could be yeah. happening long after you leave. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've seen people laying in the street screaming and wailing. Um, I've seen people making threats and, you know, reaching into their pockets like they have a weapon and, you know, mad at everybody, mad at the whole world and threatening me and threatening the police officers and threatening the neighbors. And, and, and I've seen a lot of people just in shock and, uh, yeah. it's, it's a whole mix of that and it's different every time. Well, I'm curious then with, I'm sure what you've seen, all the things that you can't unsee. Mm -hmm. Is there, how do you process things just for yourself? I mean, it, I love what you said and that you know that you're wired for this. You're called to this. 
but there's still yeah. just the humanity of what you have to see that how do you decompress from what you have to deal with on any given day? Um, you know, to whom much of has been given much is expected. And mm -hmm. I was raised in a very stable home by two loving parents. Um, never experienced violence as a child, uh, super stable. Um, my adult life has been super stable. I mean, obviously I've been in one church for over 20 years. Um, I've been married for 25 years. I, I have a lot of stability. And so the, I, I am, I am blessed with a lot of resources to help me, uh, decompress and to help deal with the stresses of ministry and chaplaincy and everything else. Uh, so, so I, I naturally just have a lot of, of, uh, benefits. And, and so I kind of feel like, boy, if somebody should be exposed to these things, I mean, I'm better equipped for it than maybe some people might be. So, so I, mm. I some of that is no credit to me at all. It's just my circumstances. Um, but at the same time, there's also an attitude that you go in and, and I see in this world today that we have a, a real split. I mean, I, I think everybody, not everybody, but, but the vast majority of people expect that it'll be perfect someday and yeah. secular people kind of hope for a utopia and that we can just keep progressing forward and build utopia here on earth. Uh, religious people, especially Christians hope for heaven. And, and the utopia and heaven are very similar in a lot of ways, but they're also very different because heaven is something that God will bring about supernaturally. Mm. And so if I don't see heaven right now, it's okay. It's not my hands anyway. God will fix it later. I just need to make sure I'm on God's side. But if, if I'm hoping for utopia, then I could become impatient and be like, well, why aren't these other people helping me build utopia right now? And they're in mm -hmm. the way and I'm angry at them and they're slowing us down. And that's where you leave, that's where you get cancel culture where are like, well, you're in the way we're going to cancel. We're going to basically kill you in an online internet kind of sense. And, and that is a very negative, pessimistic, you're ruining it for me. You know, if you just get out of my way, I could make it better if I was king of the world. And mm. that that utopia desire, I think, breeds cynicism and makes you unhealthy. And and that's not saying that people of no faith are all unhealthy. It, it's just, I think, in general terms, that's true, that that wanting utopia leads to lashing out at other people mm. where wanting heaven because it's not dependent on us. I think that gives us the ability to be more forgiving of other people and forgiving of situations. So, so life is terrible. And there are people out there who are hurting children and killing one another and stealing from one another and doing all sorts of terrible things. And I can look at that as a police chaplain and say, yeah, this is truly awful. It is tragic and terrible, but God's going to fix it someday. And so mm -hmm. I have an attitude that helps me lean into hope. Um, these people are not stealing my utopia they are just living in a broken world. And my belief is that God is going to fix this broken world someday. So, so I have hope. And so take that natural resiliency that my parents gave me and this hope that I have for my Christian faith. And, and, you know, frankly, I, I can endure it pretty well. Um, Sebastian Younger wrote a book about uh, PTSD and stress with, uh, you know, in a military context. And he pointed out some stats that that a lot of people in the military who have PTSD are are actually, um, you know, the ones who you can like predict who's going to get it. Because if you have a sibling with a mental disorder or a psychiatric condition, you're X amount more likely to end up with PTSD. And you don't have to have had a fellow soldier soldier down your arms. You, mm. you could just be near a combat zone and you have a higher incidence of PTSD and all the problems that come from that. And so similar with police work, um, if you have stability and strong health and, and whatever you, you have some built in resiliency and then you can learn resiliency also. So you got your built in resiliency, you have the resiliency you can learn. And if you have both of those going for you, uh, I've seen a lot of police officers that really do handle things well. They're not three times divorced. They're not closet alcoholics. Uh, they have seen terrible, terrible things, but they've been able to mm. manage it pretty well. 
And, and I hope that I'm in a, in a similar category myself. Right. Well, in his, I imagine that, that you feel a part of that brotherhood that you arrive on that scene. You've got a bunch of officers trying to survey things. You've got maybe a, a, a great handful of first responders in general that yeah. are, are all working towards the same thing in that moment, obviously providing comfort, obviously uh, doing what you can to preserve a scene and make sure that clues are, are all amassed. Uh, yeah. but that you are truly linking arms with those guys that goes back to that, what you had said previously about that, that long-term care of building the trust and letting them know that you really are in it for the long haul. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do feel that up to a point. Um, and I, I appreciate, and I love that when, when I do feel like I'm included, when, when the officers express, um, gratitude or when they, I especially like it when they have shown like a protectiveness of me, mm. um, when we're on a scene and they're like, well, if this all goes to heck, then we're going to protect the chaplain. <laughs> and I've had that happen a couple times where they're, and I'm like, I'm like really flattered by that, that they care <laughs> about me like that. Um, but at the same time, I am an outsider. And I know yeah. that I am because I was never I never served as a police officer. I'm I'm truly a civilian and I try to learn their jargon and their lingo. I, I certainly have immersed myself in the literature so that I'm very up to speed on on the kind of officer wellness issues that they face. But but I'm still an outsider and and they have other resources besides me there's peer mm -hmm. support and department psychiatrists and all kinds of other uh, avenues for them to get help uh from fellow police officers even but but i am an outsider and and i can feel that sometimes too it can be kind of lonely because because they're all part of a club they've all sworn an oath and they wear a yeah. badge and they are part of this club that i'm not part of and i don't necessarily want to be a part of their club but uh um, that brotherhood is sometimes extended to me and to others and sometimes not. And, and really a healthy chaplain needs to just understand that and be okay with it. That, that sometimes you'll be included and sometimes you won't be. And, and that's all right. Right. Yeah. Well, and that make the way that you put that makes, makes perfect sense. I'm, I appreciate you clarifying that. Uh, as a pastor, I'm also wondering you know, I, I know that I've worked with pastors for years. Pastors love word pictures and examples in as they convey truth. Do you feel like what you see and what you deal with on the chaplain side starts to spill over into how you convey your Sunday stuff? Or do you are you able to kind of keep things very separate? No, no, it's all in the same bowl of stew. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to not be that way. My, my congregation, uh, wants me to be involved in the community. My leadership wants me to be involved this way. Um, and, and it benefits me. Uh, I certainly gain a lot of experience. I meet a lot of non-Christians this way. Uh, it, it's good for me on several levels. And when I preach and teach, which I, I preach every Sunday and I, I teach an adult class every Sunday. And I often teach during the week too. And, and I, I mean, I suppose there's probably some folks that are sick of me talking about, you know, the 500th <laughs> time I've mentioned, well, I happen to be a police chaplain and we were at this yeah. one, you know, scene one time, or, or this is a observation that I, I make, I, there, there's probably not everybody that loves that, but, but for the most part, I, I feel like I can mix the two pretty well because my, my 25 years of experience as a pastor a lot of that overlaps with being a chaplain. I mean, really, it's the same job. I am mm. pastoring these police officers. And so so the one job definitely helps the other. And then in reverse, the the chaplain experience, like I said, it it, it diversifies my um, you know, the base of my experience and and what kind of things I I mean, I'm not locked up in the chaplain in the uh in the pastor study. You know, in my ivory tower separated from the world. I mean, I'm I'm out there meeting all kinds of people and having all kinds of experiences. And a lot of it's not, you know, not in my control. And and that probably grows me as a person. And so so I think it benefits. And, you know, I, I, I talk like I I mentioned 
stuff all the time. I really don't. The, the, the chaplain's work is in small spurts, and I might only get called out a few times a month, and each of those may only be a few hours. And so, and so most of my week, I am, I'm just a pastor at a church, but if that Mm. pager goes off, I'm going to have a real intense hour and a half or, or two hours or three hours, and it'll be super intense and boy, I'll learn a lot and it'll be really memorable, but, but you know, it doesn't really take up very much of my time. So, so, uh, most of my life is, is relatively unchanged. It just, I have a few cool stories now. Hey, I just wanted to cut in for a quick minute. I hope that you're enjoying the theme this month and hearing insights from these great pastors. I know I have. Two quick things. Number one, do you know someone who you think would be a great guest here in the Nook? Drop me an email and tell me about them. The address is stephen at nookpodcast.com. That's stephen with a V at nookpodcast.com. And that address is always listed in the show notes. And I look forward to hearing from you. And number two, if these podcasts have been a value add for you, would you consider making a small donation to help offset the costs? There is a link that's also in the show notes that allows you to buy me a coffee. It's a simple way for you to drop a few bucks in the tip jar. Thanks in advance for that. All right, now let me get you back to this conversation with Jared Altick. Well, in in what you mentioned previously about how this just seemed to kind of become part of what you do naturally, yeah. Uh, do you feel like you already had the that really big compassion piece, or has that grown perhaps exponentially to just be full of grace and ready to not be defensive? and really be able to immerse yourself in those situations. It, it, being a chaplain has definitely taught me new nuances where I, you know, cause before I, as a pastor, I didn't have to think very much about like the legal consequences of something I would casually say to somebody. Mm. Uh, whereas chaplain, I do, I have to be very careful about what I, what I, you know, I, I don't just speculate about what might be happening. I just can't do that as a chaplain. And so mm-hmm. there's some discipline that I've gained, um, you know, so so that is definitely new. Uh, but like I said a moment ago, I, I really have, you know, I feel like my whole life has kind of been steered toward this. Uh, the police officers and military type folks that I've known my entire life have informed how I interact with the department and the department's very military. Like, you know, there's ranks of sergeants and captains and majors, et cetera. And, and and knowing how to address people in a chain of command, even though I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm thoroughly civilian, but, but, but I can learn, okay, that's a major, uh, the sergeant is in charge of this scene, but the major outranks him and and having a sense of that and being able to address them appropriately, uh, builds their confidence in me. And so, mm. so that, that helps. <laughs> and so yeah, some of that I've had, I've had, I've had that my whole life. I, I just have been around these people and, and I've been soaking it up for a long, long time. So some of it I had to start already, uh, but some of it definitely I'm getting new skills and I'm learning, I'm growing in new ways because it's a, it's a pretty intense experience when it happens. So. Right. And I imagine it's all very fluid that, no, no two two scenes are going to be identical, and that you've got to be be able to zag when it when you thought you would just zig. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and and like I'll, I'll pull up to a scene, and and usually I get right to it. I'll be following GPS, and and I'll pull up to the block, and it's not until I turn that last corner that I see all the lights and everything. And, and I try to locate a sergeant because the sergeant runs the scene and I try to figure out from the sergeant, okay, you know, who, who's our victim and what kind of death was it and who's our point of contact with the family. And I get all that basic information. And some of that is the same every time, but, but the details and the certain, the particular circumstances are really shocking sometimes and it's like oh wow oh, sure okay i mean we had we had a had one a while back where it was a deceased individual in a house a parent suicide 
and we had a girlfriend's family there, but we also had a boyfriend who was there. And the boyfriend was just absolutely inebriated, just drunk as can be and probably high. And, and we're trying to figure out, you know, well, is everybody telling us the truth here? And, and what, what kind of situation is this? And, and we weren't sure if, if it was, if we should just take it at face value or was somebody overstating their connection. And, and it's like, huh, well, we'll, we'll just kind of roll with it, I guess. And, and, uh, and treat everybody with compassion and, and we'll just make the best of it. But, but I mean, sometimes I've wondered if somebody was really a relative or if they were just a busybody and kind of nosy. And, and sometimes mm. we don't sort that out right in that first hour. Uh, it gets sorted out later, but, but when I'm there in that first hour, sometimes I'm kind of, right. kind of suspicious <laughs> if these people are who they say they oh, are. I can imagine. Yeah. Um, you've talked several times here about, you know, what it's like rolling up on a scene. Uh, I'm just curious, do you have a moment with God? Do you, or is it kind of, you have to shift into the work immediately? And I, you know, I'm just, I'm, it's, it's that, uh, you know, are you doing what you've been trained, what you've been called to do? Where is your faith in those, in what could be the worst day for a family yeah. or a police um, officer? It would be incorrect to say that I have time to like stop and say a prayer or get centered or whatever your jargon is, um, you know, before that happens. A lot of times I, I already know I'm late because I got paged mm. from all the way across town and I had to travel there and they've been waiting for 20 minutes for me. And, and so, and so often I feel very rushed and when we feel rushed, that often pushes God out of the equation. And mm -hmm. so I think a chaplain needs to be doing his prayer and his preparation before the pager goes off. That has to already be squared away. Uh, you need to, to, examine if you can love people in crisis because because some of these people in crisis are not innocent it'd be great mm. if every victim was innocent but they're not always sometimes the victim was the agitator and the victim was a drug dealer and the whole family is is corrupt and dishonest and bad for the community and whatever but you know what their loved ones still died and yeah. they still deserve god's love and, yeah. and so I'm not there to pass judgment on them. I'm there to, to love them. And I, and I, that means I'm going to have to, to really be squared away spiritually before I get into that situation. I can't work it out in the moment. There's too much going on. Uh, sure. it's too, it's happening too fast. Or it's too intense. So, so I have to square that away in advance that no matter what kind of person I come up to and what kind of barrier there might be or what I might personally find distasteful, I, I better have worked that out with God that I can love my neighbor no matter what. And, and it, I may be ministering to someone who, who is themselves a perpetrator of violence. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe not in that particular situation, but, but maybe, I mean, we may know that, okay, this whole family, they're all in and out of jail and, and they're all drug dealers and whatever, but that doesn't mean they, they shouldn't receive help, uh, that, that I shouldn't show them compassion, uh, mm -hmm. especially when I'm walking up and I've got a cross on my shirt and it says chaplain, I, I, I better represent Christ well. And he, he reached out to the sinners, the tax collectors, the prostitutes. He, he reached out to everybody. So I better be able to do the same thing. So, mm -hmm. so that's, I think that's preparation has to be done in advance personally. Uh, not that I haven't been on scene and said some pretty quick prayers because <laughs> <laughs> that's happened too. If I felt like it was getting a little, little hot, a little dangerous, I, I've had a few times where that's happened and I've been like, Oh Lord, uh, yeah. <laughs> I come to you now <laughs> yes. in my hour of need. Hit, but, me, uh, hit me now. Yeah. <laughs> um, in most of these instances, do you feel like you're able to just walk away when you know that your work on scene is done or do you inevitably at least mentally end up taking some of that home with you whether that's imagery or somebody that you've 
had to deal with, you know, whether that's one of the police officers or one of the, the victim's families, whatever, you know, to where you you're you're still having to process that maybe after you've been home for a couple hours. Yes and no. Uh, it's a mix like the dead bodies. I've I've not only seen the bodies a lot of times when the funeral home or the coroner comes, uh, they need assistance moving the bodies. Mm. And so I'll actually help carry the body out if we can't maybe get a gurney into a place where a body's at. You put the body in a body bag and you have to just carry it out as respectfully as you can. Uh, that's not very easy, but, but it can be done. Yeah. And I'm a big guy. So I, I often offer to, to help move the body down a flight of stairs or up out of a basement or something like that to put it on a gurney. Um, and I'm surprised that of all the bodies and disfiguring grievous wounds I've seen, whatever, I don't think I've ever dreamed about one. Uh, that mm. doesn't seem to bother me much. But but I tell you, I do take home when I see an officer um, who's upset that that hurts me. And and I, sure. I I especially and some officers are not open to me coming up to them and, you know, spending time with them. Some are, but but some aren't. And and when yeah. I see an officer that I think I'm seeing red flags just for my years of experience as a counselor, if I think if I think that they're receiving a moral injury and they are not open to me helping them that creates a frustration and a and a worry and a concern in me that i i man it eats me up but i do the yeah. same thing at church i've got people mm -hmm. in church that oh i just wish they would listen to me if if, if they'd <laughs> let me make all the decisions for their lives then they'd be fine but they won't and and, yeah. and i can't convince them to do the right thing and i love them and i want them to be okay but i can see they're going down a bad path and and whether it's church or chaplaincy Either way, I those things deeply bother me for a long time. I I get pretty wrapped up in that, and that that affects me. It affects my health. It affects you know my well being, um, mm. and so so some things I carry, and it's very difficult for me to process. Uh, but other things, honestly, it it rolls off my back, and 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 uh, you know it's part of the short term element of it too. With a family, I'll probably never see them again. And yeah. so I, I have to just make myself let go. And it's like, okay, I can't live and die with that family. That family has their own support network, uh, whatever, however much they might have. And, and I've handed it off and it's not mine anymore. I need to let it go. And, and is this something that you hard. ever talk about, like with your wife, uh, you know, does, does the family, you know, I'm just curious with the family kind of dynamic with you having to, they have to know that you're dealing with some pretty hardcore things when you go out on these calls. Is it something you process with them or is it just kind of, you know, that's, that's what he goes and does and we pray for yeah. his safety. And my wife was a paramedic when we were younger. And so she has seen some pretty bad stuff. And mm. so I will frequently in very generic general terms, you know, no names or specifics, but just, yes, I saw a suicide today or, or there was a dead baby or something like that. And, and she's very good at comforting me because she has seen some of those things herself. And, and so that's, that's helpful. Um, but, but at the same time, there's privacy about some of these things. Uh, yeah. There's, you know, legal processes that are happening. And so I can't get too open about it. Um, I, sometimes I talk with the police officers and we'll kind of decompress afterward or the next day I'll, I'll make a effort to go by and see them as they're starting their shift the following day. And, and sometimes there's some, you know, behind closed doors, some gallows humor, uh, you know, the way that a lot of young men, especially process, they joke about it and make light of things you should never make light of, but, yeah. but they do that as a way to process that stress. And I'd rather them do it that way than the other typical ways. The other typical ways of processing stress is cursing and drinking. Yep. And so they swear like sailors and drink themselves to sleep. And, and that's, those are destructive ways to yeah. deal with that stress. And so, so talking about it, even if it is, you know, very much a behind closed doors type of conversation. Um, I, I'm glad to participate in those because those helped me too. Well, I've already mentioned how I know that probably too many of us are over influenced by the depictions that we see of these things on television. Is there anything about your work, about what you see 
that might be just really surprising to people uh, because we maybe haven't dealt with that level of things thus far. Yes. Um, a million little details. I watch police TV shows in a completely different light now oh, I'm uh, sure. <laughs> because there's so many little details that a, that a TV show gets wrong and and surprising little details that they get right. And hmm. and it's interesting watching that. So. So, yes, there, there are all kinds of little things that uh, um, that I notice now being, you know, having one foot in that world. Uh, but I think the big thing that I would love to communicate to people is that these officers are multidimensional. And so let's say you're interacting with the police and you've got grumpy officer and there's that's a very common stereotype. You've got he's usually a sergeant and he's seen enough of this junk and he's just mm -hmm. tired of it all. And he's real short and terse and 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 kind of gruff with you and whatever. And what people walk away thinking is, that, oh, that's what he's like all the time. Mm. And what I've seen is that some of the hard nosed, tough and gruff, grumpy types are actually, I mean, that's just a defensive mechanism. And some of those guys have reached in and pulled their wallet out and given somebody, you know, tens of, do of dollars or hundreds of dollars to get a hotel room or to pay an electric bill or, or, I mean, they have personally sacrificed and they, you know, have, and I'm not going to tell any specific stories, but, but I've witnessed generically speaking, you know, the, the officers that you think are so closed off emotionally and unrelatable and tough and jaded and cynical that they then deal with a 10 year old kid. And this soft teddy bear persona emerges mm. and they mentor that child and they show a fatherly care for this child. And I'm watching my eyes as big as saucers. Like, I can't believe what I'm seeing because mm -hmm. just like everybody else, I thought, well, my first impression must be what they're like 100% of the time. And that's not true. Uh, our police officers today are more professional than they're given credit for. They are very well educated. They are very well trained. And a lot of them are in this job because they love people. And mm. so, sure, it's exciting to shoot guns, and drive cars fast and whatever. And police officers do like that stuff. But but they also really, really care about their communities. They care about children. They care about homeless people. Mm. Um Th th there's compassion and sensitivity there that Hollywood almost always fails to convey. And I think a lot of the public just has no idea the rich depth that a lot of police officers have. Mm, that's awesome. Uh, I always like to leave room at the end for my guests just to say, uh, if is there anything that an area or that you thought we might talk about that we haven't, or just something else that's on your mind or your heart that I, I just consider this open mic time that yeah. I, I don't ever want to leave a, a, a thought unspoken if there is one. No. Um, it, maybe if you're wanting to help police officers, um, let me throw out a couple ideas that I've covered in my own podcast uh, recently. Uh, if you, if you can find out when your county or city is doing memorials, which is almost always in May, although with COVID, it's often been delayed. There's been some stuff here in October of 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, but but it, it, if you check each May, most places have some sort of memorial week or, or you know, a service downtown at City Hall or something like that. If you can help with that, if you can volunteer or donate money or donate food or, or help with that. That's a great way to show support to police and to the survivors of, uh, you know, like the family members of police officers who've been killed in the line of duty. Uh, that's a good way to help. If you want to help, a lot of people are like, Hey, we love police officers. So we're going to send them a tub of popcorn at Christmas or, or, you know, we love our dispatchers. So we're going to send them a pizza at 10 o'clock at night. Those are good things, but that's what everybody does. I've had mm -hmm. dispatchers tell me, please, no more pizza. <laughs> everybody <laughs> sends us a pizza. Um, so so sometimes it's good to just ask, um, ask how you can help 
others. And, and, um, if you ask the officer directly, they'll say, I don't need anything. Uh, same yeah. thing with dispatch or a fire. They'll say, Oh, we're fine. We're fine. We don't need anything, but ask party a, how you can help party B because mm. they'll know. And they'll know actually what we really need. Um, so a unique request we had this last summer was the officers wanted popsicles like the mm. plastic, like basically frozen Kool-Aid in a plastic tube. It, sure. they, it was so hot and they wear all of that gear and they lose so much. There's like, can I, I just want something cold. Yeah. <laughs> and so popsicles, yeah. little, you know, they, those things can't cost. They're probably a hundred for a dollar. I mean, they're so cheap and, yeah. and, but that's not something people typically think of. And, and other officers knew that the ones on patrol during the day wanted that. And mm. so, and so if you can just be creative and ask good questions about how you can help, uh, there are plenty of ways to support your officers and make their life a little bit better. Uh, I think people nowadays do a pretty good job of telling officers that they love them and that they support them. Uh, I feel like our officers see a lot of that. They get a lot of cards from first grade classes and things like that. And that's good. Uh, keep doing that for sure. Uh, but there's lots of other little ways to help. A conversation like this can be difficult to listen to, but I think it's important. My mother was a 911 operator for more than 20 years, and the stories that she used to tell me were at times so unbelievable. There are just some really unthinkable things happening in this imperfect world. And that's why I'm grateful for people like Jared Altick, who can share the love of Jesus in situations where it is needed most. Even when it's just the ministry of presence. I love how he talked about that. Because I think that's something that any one of us who call ourselves Christ followers can practice. I know I'm guilty of it those moments when you're sitting with someone going through a really rough time and you start trying to come up with the perfect thing to say. Sometimes in those moments, our silence is okay and our simple presence is enough. It's a really good reminder about the scripture that says to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Jared has a great podcast that centers on chaplaincy. I invite you to check that out. There is a link in the show notes that makes it easy to find. While you're in the show notes, you can also find a link to the Nook Facebook page and my social media feeds if you'd like to follow along. I've got some really great episodes in the hopper for November, so make sure that you are subscribed or following or whatever your preferred podcast delivery service offers. Come on back. I think you will enjoy it. Thank you so much for listening, and I will catch you here next time in The Nook. The Nook Podcast is a production of Sozo Digital Media.